Hello everyone, welcome to lecture number five. In this lecture, I will explain the safety review process that is necessary in developing CubeSat. You will learn the policies and concepts of safety design and the safety analysis process in this lecture. So let's begin. The International Space Station, it's called ISS, is a huge human construction located about 400 kilometers above the Earth. And it did tackle the Earth every 90 minutes per orbit. 50 countries and organizations participate in the ISS project, including NASA, Russia, ESA, Canada, and Japan. The ISS is a unique platform in orbit and has habitable units. Several crews remain on the ISS to conduct experiments and research. JAXA has an experimental module called Kibo. Kibo has unique function such as airlock and remote manipulator system, which enable to do the variety of space experiments on the Kibo exposed facility. One of some unique system is JSOT to deploy small satellites. JAXA has been conducting satellite development from cable continuously since 2012. When using JSOT to deploy satellite like CubeSat, the satellite provider will be the one of the ISS users. And if you are going to use the ISS, you need to make a safety design for the satellite you are developing and pass a safety review. As a participant in the ISS program, JAXA is responsible for ensuring the safety of our mission under the overall responsibility of NASA. JAXA is responsible for guaranteeing the safety of the cable, the visiting vehicle, and other payloads. The JAXA safety review panel will review the human systems, including experimental payloads and so on. Why do we need to conduct safety design? There have been many accidents in the history of human space development. In other words, human space development is the history of struggles. The developers and operators of the ISS system and payloads and so on, of course, take care to make sure no accident happen, but accidents still happen. There is no such things as absolutely safe, so we must recognize that there is risk everywhere and it is closer to manage and minimize it. In order to ensure the safety of cable, sufficient safety measures will be taken according to the following basic rules based on the system safety standard and the safety level process requirements. And Risks will be minimized as much as possible by managing hazard. First, for target of safety assurance, the ISS is a system that includes human and safety, must be ensured in order to prevent death or injury to the crew or loss of a spacecraft. Second, regarding how to ensure safety. In the de development and operation of the cable, and new payload, all hazards will be identified and controlled. The first priority for control is to eliminate the hazard. And if that is not possible, you should control another method as I explain that later. And the risks of the remaining hazards will be evaluated. And then you need to consider the special care of human activities. Any of cable systems shall be designed to protect a crew and to conserve safety related device. Next, I explain how to proceed with the human safety, safety design in order to prevent loss of the ISS and death or injury to crews, hazards should be identified at an early stage of the design process and kept under control during the development phases. As you may have already learned in other lectures, the development flow of a satellite 
consists of a preliminary design phase, critical design phase, and production and testing phase. Safety design is carried out in accordance with each of the satellite development phases. During the primary design phase, the satellite provider should carry out understanding the target system, hazard and hazard cause identification, and risk assessment from the view of the safety design. And at this stage, you need to pass phase one of the safety review. During the critical design phase, you should eliminate of hazard causes and set control and verification method and pass phase two of the safety review. During the production and testing phase, you need to verify of hazard control method and evaluate of residual risk. Finally, the safety review panel, safety review phase three will be held where the actual flight model will be reviewed. Also, the evaluation will be conducted by safety experts and reviewed by a board member chosen independently of any hardware provider. The steps of safety analysis described on the previous page are six steps as shown in this slide. The first step is to fully understand the functions and performance of the target system, its operating method, the environmental condition encountered by the system, and interface with other system. The second step, you need to identify all foreseeable hazards of the target system and its operation by means of FTA, FMEA, checking with standard hazards, and so on. Also, the hazard causes should be identified. The third step, you need to access, uh, assess the risk by combining the level of damage and the likelihood of occurrence. The fourth step, hazard causes should be eliminated as much as possible. If hazard causes cannot be removed, they should be controlled. In addition, a verification method for hazard control should be established. These steps should be completed by the time the satellite design is completed. The fifth steps, you need to verify of hazard control method by one or a combination of testing, analysis, inspection, and demonstration. Finally, you need to evaluate the result of the verification of the hazard control method to ensure that the residual risk of the hazard is controlled to a sufficient low level. These two steps will be carried out during the flight model development phase. Following these steps, let's try the human safety design analysis for CubeSat as an example. First one is understanding the target system. First of all, you understand what is the external and internal shape of the satellite you are designing and what kind of components will be installed. For example, solar cells are mounted on the, the outer panel of the satellite on plus minus X and Y panel to power supply and a camera to take pictures is mounted on the plus Z panel. Then the six poles are layered and the four batteries are mounted on the bottom layer and so on. Also, for the components, you also need the detailed information of specification. In addition, you need to consider there are any configuration changes after the satellite deploy deployment. For example, there are two deployable antennas that will be deployed 30 minutes after the satellite is released. Next, you need to understand the overall processes for the satellite deployment operation. The de developed satellite will be handed over to JAXA and mounted in the deployment case. 
Then the deployment case with satellite is stored in a special bag for transport and launched as cargo on a rocket. After the cargo arrived at the ISS, it is transported to the Kibo module. And then the crew installed the deployment case onto the March purpose experimental platform. After that, the experimental module, experimental platform with the deployment cases is carried out of outside of the Kibo through a door called the airlock. The experimental platform will be coupled to a robot arm called GEM AMS, which moves it to the deployment position. When everything is ready, commands are sent from the ground and the satellite is deployed. And then the satellite enters an orbit around the Earth and gradually moved away from the ISS. After 30 minutes, the satellite begins antenna deployment and operation. Now we have all target systems covered. Let's move on to the next step. The next step is to identify the hazard and their causes. A hazard is defined as a condition in which factors cause causing an accident are uh, apparent or latent. And hazards can be classified into two categories according to their degree of damage. One hazard that causes the most damage is called a catastrophic hazard. When this occurs, there is a condition that could result in loss of the ISS or a fatal injury to the crew. Hazard causes are a fire and depressurization and so on. The other hazard is a critical hazard, a condition that may result in damage to the ISS equipment or injury to clues has arisen. This hazard does not result in the loss of the ISS or human life, but it does result in mechanical failures and clue injuries, making it an extraordinary situation. There are 40 categories called as standard hazard to be evaluated. Number one, two, and three are related to materials. The satellite provider must present a list of all the materials to be used and get permission from a safety professional team. Number four is related to shape particles. For example, hazard caused is the floating pieces of a walking glass and so on. Number five is related to the shape of the external structure for satellite. For example, it should not have a shape edges because it may damage other equipment on the ISS or the crew. Number six and seven a burn and radiation expose, exposure to the clue. For number eight, nine, and eleven, the satellite is mounted on deployment case and powered off inside the, the ISS. So this hazard is not taken into account. Regarding number 10, the satellite have charged battery. So the satellite provider needs to proper circuit and wire design to prevent overcharge, over discharge, and internal short, and so on. Hazard trap 13 and 14, when the satellite has non-ionizing radiation system, rotating equipment, and sealed container, you should consider it hazard. Also, if the hazard cannot be classified as a standard hazard, it should be classified as a unique hazard. In the case of CubeSat, there is a battery system in the satellite, so electrolyte can leak and batteries can rupture, potentially leading to injury to the ISS crew to damage to other equipment on the ISS. Also, there is a hazard 
that the satellite may collide with the ISS structure when it is deployed. The unique hazard varies depending on the specification and condition for the satellite. Once the hazards are identified, it is time to consider their causes. Let's think about the causes of unique hazards. As one of unique hazards, it is the leaking electrolyte and battery rupture. It can lead to contamination, corrosion, injury to the ISS crew, or damage to another equipment on the ISS. For this hazard, there are five causes. One is occurrence of an internal short in the battery. The second is an external short. The third and the fourth are due to overcharging or over discharging the battery respectively. And the last one is thermal extremes. Next, we would like to consider a unique hazard of collision with the ISS. The area where the satellite can go through is indicated by the red cone. As shown in the light figure, so the satellite is deployed nominally, it will not deviate from this area. If a satellite is deformed and or damaged, and it may not be deployed as expected. There is a concern that can collide with another satellite and the ISS, ISS structure. For this hazard, there are six causes. First cause is inadequate structural strength for launch in orbit load and depressurization. Second cause it's improper material selection and proceeding, including years of stress corrosion sensitive materials. Third cause is material fatigue or propagation of inherent creep, inherent quarks or internal forms. Fourth, fourth cause is usage of substandard materials. Fifth cause is losing the fasteners during launch and in orbit. Finally, one is improper manufacturing and or assembly. This slide is showing another collision hazards. As a hazard, inadvertent deployment of antenna inside the satellite deployment case can cause collision with the ISS. Also, inappropriate design and or manufacturing of the satellite may lead to incorrect satellite deployment from deployment case. And one cause is inadvertent deployment of the antenna before satellite deployment. Furthermore, the causes can be divided into two categories. One is sticking due to inadvertent deployment inside a deployment case or striking adjacent satellites. And the other is an appropriate design or manufacture of the satellite. This photo shows a nominal satellite deployment. Currently, up to six satellites can be released at the time. Therefore, if the inadvertent deployment will occur, not only will the ISS be affected because it's one satellite will not be released, but also the satellite mounted on the satellite case will not be released. You have identified the hazards and causes so far. Let's move to the next topic. The third step is a risk assessment. Risks are classified into four damage levels and the five likelihood of occurrence. The damage level indicates the level of impact to the ISS and crew. The highest one is catastrophic. This level can cause crew death, death or the ISS loss. Second one, it is a critical and se severe damage to the ISS crew and to the ISS. 
Third one is a marginal problem with minor damage to clue and the ISS. The lowest level is negligible. In other words, it damage does not affect the clue or the, or the ISS. Also, likelihood of occurrence are classified of five levels. The highest one is frequent and likely to occur immediately. Second one is probable and probably will occur in time. Third one is occasional and may occur in time. Fourth one is remote and unlikely to occur. Fifth one is improbable and improbable to occur. Since risk assessment requires a combination of damage levels and, and likelihood of occurrence. Let's consider the risk level with damage level on the vertical side and likelihood of occurrence on the horizontal axis. In this matrix, the damage level is the largest and the likelihood of occurrence is the highest in the upper left. The frame of bottom light has the lowest level of damage and the lowest likelihood of occurrence. This matrix is divided into three areas. The red area is distinguished as an acceptable risk. The yellow area requires an acceptable or an acceptable decision. And the green area is an acceptable risk. Hazards that lead to high risk need to be eliminated. The hazard elimination is to eliminate the degree of damage or the possibility of its occurrence by fundamentally eliminating the course of the hazard through design. Unfortunately, however, identify hazard those that cannot be hazard eliminated are identified as residual risks and then hazard control is needed. Hazard control aims to reduce the likelihood of a hazard occurring. In other words, the likelihood of occurrence of death in the red or yellow area should be reduced to make the risk classified in the green area. When the risk is classified as yellow or the risk changes from a red area to a yellow area, it is the scope of the hazard report. In this case, the method of control to the hazard must be verified, verifiable, and the hazard report must be prepared to decide whether the risk is acceptable or not by the safety team. In the next step, we begin to eliminate control of the hazard causes and establish of the verification plan. After the risk has been assessed, you need to consider how to eliminate and control the hazard causes. As explained in step three, the first priority is to eliminate the root cause of the hazard design. For example, do not use toxic materials and so on. If a hazard cannot be eliminated, measures should be taken, such as by designing the most effective way to reduce potential human and material losses. Our goal is reducing the frequency and extent of damage to an acceptable level by controlling the hazard to an acceptable level. There are five control methods. So uh, the next slide will introduce them. The first hazard control method is fault tolerant design. This design method provides independent hazard protection function to prevent safety problems from occurring in the event of backage. And it is needed to install an energy shut off device if an intended operation could happen because of a malfunction. For example, as this diagram shows, for hazard causes, the developer can set switches and other devices that do not lead to a hazard. Even if the device malfunctions 
or is operated incorrectly, so the hazard does not occur. Also, the allowable number of failures depends on the level of damage. When the hazard is classified as a catastrophic hazard, measures must be taken to prevent accident in the event of two failures, two mishap, or one failure and one mishap occurring simultaneously. In the case of critical hazards, measures must be taken to ensure that the single failure or mishap does not result in an accident. This accident means damage to the ISS equipment or easily to close. The second hazard control method is designed for minimum risk. When failure tolerance design is not applicable, design methodology for minimizing the risk of hazard occurrence by ensuring adequate design margins. This method involves design designed the hazard with sufficient margins and appropriate safety factors in order to minimize the risk of its occurrence. This method is acceptable only in the following area. When design for minimum risk is not applicable, the third hazard control method is installing the safety devices. This is a measure to minimize the impact of damage in the event of an anomaly. For example, the pressure vessel should be equipped with a safety valve and a system to adjust the pressure so that it does not become too high. The force hazard control method is installing alarm and emergency equipment. This is detection of hazardous conditions notification of flight crews or ground crew, and execution of appropriate emergency procedure after detection. For example, installation of fire detection systems, fire extinguishers, and portable oxygen masks. Since all crew members know the responses for these hazards, we do not prepare individual hazard responses for all installed product, products, but rather flow established procedures. The fifth hazard control method is operational procedures. This method avoids hazardous situation through operational procedures when they cannot be dealt with by design. For example, the satellite is turned off before deploy deployment to avoid an RF radiation effect to the crew. After you have decided on a control method, you need to set up a verification method and procedure. The method timing and acceptance criteria for the verification are set in advance. This slide shows the plan for battery evaluation test as an example. First of all, the satellite developer conducts load sampling test of battery to prevent initial defects. After you can select the candidate cells for a flight, an acceptance test is conducted on the battery itself. Through the vibration and vacuum test, you make sure that the performance of the battery remains the same before and after these tests. After the battery is installed in the satellite and the satellite environmental test is completed, a final checkout is performed to ensure that there is no degradation of the battery performance. The next step is the safety analysis to be performed during the satellite development phase. In step five, the verification is performed on the flight model according to the verification plan decided in step four and accepted safety review phase two. The satellite developer needed to verify the developed flight model according to your verification method and procedure approved by safety review. For the test, you can confirm that the 
product or operation meets the required specifications and the typical environment and operation plan. For the analysis, the performance can be estimated and verified through calculation and simulations. For the inspection, you can confirm that can be immediately determined by visual observation and measurement. For example, to confirm that the fastener has not loosed before and after the vibration test, so torque mark here should be at the fasteners for visual inspection after the vibration test. For the demonstration, the design is confirmed to be able to use for practical purpose. For example, actual power on the satellite and make sure that the antenna will be deployed and started radiating at the set time by itself. Then you also need the management by safety verification tracking log. It called SVTL. Verification is basically to be completed before the satellite is handed over to JAXA. However, those for which final verification is to be performed before a launch is identified and managed in the SVTL. For the CubeSat, the satellite is mounted on a deployment case after JAXA receives the satellite. Whether the satellite has been successfully cased or not will be managed by the SVTL. Finally, we perform residual risk assessment on the actual flight model. Using the risk assessment matrix explained in step three, the satellite developer check again to see that all risks have been addressed. Have all items classified in the lead area been eliminated? For those that fall into the yellow area, have you prepared a hazard report and had it uploaded by the safety review? The safety reviewer confirms that all actions have been completed and uploaded. The safety design process was comp is completed. You may feel that it is a dif difficult task to do by yourselves. JAXA will support you in the actual development of your satellite. Summary. The hazard identify loss of crew or space station functions at the most critical event and safety design assessment and uh, reviews are conducted by investigating the causes of the event. According to the system's safety standard and the st safety review process requirements, risks will be minimized by managing hazard. The satellite provider shall be connect conducted safety design analysis. I have covered all the topics. Is your satellite ready to launch? Thank you for your attention.